are getting more and more exotic. Uh, fortunately, this time he prefaced his introduction by some remarks on narcotics, which, which uh, set the tone for the uh, <laughs> subsequent remarks. Uh, in uh, tackling this topic beyond efficiency, what I, what I hope to do is to uh, take a look as an economist at a market system, marketplace, and uh, ask to what extent, if any, is there validity in the general uh, charge, the general complaint, that markets are somehow uncivilized, unethical, that they violate uh, many of the cherished values of civilized uh, men and women, <coughs> and that uh, the, the ethical shortcomings of the market uh, may possibly outweigh the uh, economic advantages of a market. In other words, this, this uh, position that we will be considering claims that it may be true that a market is efficient. It may be true that a free market delivers the goods, that capitalism generates prosperity. That may be the case. But nonetheless, uh, this prosperity, this efficiency, is purchased at too high an ethical cost. The price is too high. Uh, now, it might, it might be uh, argued that this uh, criticism, this charge, ought to be evaluated not by an economist, but by a, uh, a philosopher, uh, someone with expertise in, the, in ethical theory, perhaps a theologian, Yet I, I, will, I will tackle this topic strictly as an economist. Uh, my, my point, I think, will be to show that those who, in fact, criticize the market for generating uncivilized, unethical behavior generally operate under some misunderstanding as to what the market system is and how it operates. So in order to clarify those issues, it's necessary, really, not to address uh, these questions from the point of view of professional ethics, but rather from the point of view of, of economic science, to show that a proper understanding of the way in which a market system operates would, I think, go a long way to show that these uh, complaints are uh, substantially without ground. Now, um, I, I don't want to prejudge uh, prejudge what I'm going to say uh, in your minds, uh, but uh, well, let me then jump immediately to to a definition of what a market is. First of all, you know what a market is, no doubt. But I would like you to see a market in a rather special way. I would like you to see a market as a social system in which there is a given system of rights, a given system of property rights, human rights, civil rights, any rights you want, they're all the same. All rights are human rights, all rights are civil rights, all rights are property rights. There's no difference. A market then starts out with a given system of rights. So that we, we, in, in criticizing a market or in analyzing a market, one is not concerned, you see, with the way in which a particular rights systems come to be constructed. That's imported from the outside. Okay. And indeed, a market system can, uh, uh, could exist with, uh, within a w wide variety of different systems of rights. Uh, for example, a system in which slavery were, were permitted could still be a market system. A system in which slavery, slavery is prohibited is also a market system may also be a market system. A system in which inheritance, uh, inheritance laws are written one way may be just as much a market system as one in which inheritance, lo inheritance laws are written a different way. So that the, the particular pattern of rights is, is, is one which has to be imported from the outside. It has to be taken for granted by the analysis of the market and is of therefore no concern of ours this evening. But within the given system of rights, a market system is one in which all participating individuals in the system are free to exchange rights 
among themselves without hindrance, provided uh, the participating parties to the exchange wish to do so, of course. So that if I have property and you have property and we wish to exchange, then we may do so. If I have, if I have the right to talk, you see, and you have the right to money, and you wish to pay me not to talk, you may do so. And I may sell my right to talk so I won't talk, you see. Or if I have the right not to talk, and you have the right to money, and you wish me to talk, you may pay me and I will talk, as I'm going to do right now, you see. So, so exchange, exchange permits uh, individual members of a system to exchange the rights which we start out with, which they start out with. Now, for a pure market system, that's all we need. All we need is, is a system which there are given rights. And once you have given rights, and once you've understood that given rights are able to be exchanged, then you have a market system. If one wishes to uh, introduce uh, a state, a government, into the picture, it's necessary to modify the picture a little bit. It's necessary to say that uh, we're going to set up an agency which has the power within certain limits to uh, violate other people's rights, or at any rate, to arbitrarily, at its discretion, limit those rights, so that uh, a policeman may, may, may say, well, yes, this is, this is your car, but you will please stop. So even though you thought you had the right of way and you thought you could, uh, you could proceed. So uh, if one wishes to introduce the state, uh, then in order to maintain the, the uh, basic uh, framework of a market within which we wish to conduct our analysis this evening, we'll have to make sure that the state is in fact a minimal state. That is, it it's, uh, is that minimum amount of coercion which may be considered necessary in order to protect the rights uh, which we start out with. In other words, if there, there is a possibility of rights being violated by criminal elements, then one may say state is necessary in order to set up the very right system that we, use, we have used as a defining characteristic of the market system. And that's all, that's all we will permit to, uh, uh, to intrude in the, market, in the market scene. So let us then consider a market a pure market, with just as, as much state intervention as is necessary in order to ensure the inviolability of rights. And l let us then consider uh, the question, is it, is it the case, as the critics maintain, is it the case that the market way of economic organization, as compared with alternative ways, is it true that the market way of economic organization introduces ethical problems of its own. In a society of otherwise moral individuals, will the introduction of a market system that cause, create, promote, or entail any immorality that is unique to the system itself as compared to alternative systems? The alternative system to the market is, of course, a central organization, socialism, if you will, uh, where, in fact, all rights have been surrendered to the central planning authority, uh, who makes all, uh, all allocative decisions. And the question, then, we, which we wish to examine is, supposing you had a system of moral human beings, will the endowment to them of a given set of rights with a corollary that they're free to exchange among each other, will such a system, will such a system generate immoralities of its own? Will it promote the violation of standards of decent civilized behavior? Does the, does the consideration of a possibility of market, does it entail a trade-off between efficiency and decency? Okay. That is the question I would like to consider. And uh, let me tell you in advance uh, what my own position is, so you can see where I'm going, and you can try and shoot me down in your own mind as, as we go along, and then we can take up questions, of course, later. My own position is going to be that provided one considers the initial system of rights to be a just one, then the market is ethically neutral. Now, that provided is, of course, important. If one considers slavery to be immoral, 
then a market system which permits slavery, of course, is an immoral system, by definition. But, once again, the immorality there arises out of the particular distribution of rights, not from the market itself. It's from the rights system which underlies that particular market, uh, market system. So that provided the right system is a just one, the market has nothing to do uh, with, the, uh, uh, with the definition of what the rights what should be. Provided the right system is a moral one, is a just one, then the market is ethically neutral. That is to say, it permits decent behavior and it permits indecent behavior. It permits the pursuit of ethical goals and it permits the pursuit of unethical goals. And it not, and it it's not merely that the market system permits the pursuit of these goals. The market system, in fact, promotes e the efficiency with which goals are successfully achieved. Because the market system, because the market system is efficient, is a system in which a high degree of coordination among decisions is permitted, encouraged, and generated. That, I think, is the first, is the first thing to, uh, to conclude, which I hope to be able to conclude, that the market system is neutral. Second, this is an implication, I believe, of the first, that because the market is efficient, and because the market is neutral, it therefore has the potential of efficiently encouraging the pursuit of ethical goals. So that efficiency now becomes turned into a potential handmaiden of decency and of the pursuit of ethical goals. Uh, I have a quote here from John Davenport who wrote a beautiful uh, paragraph in which he uh, remarked about the, uh, the market economy that while it is not an end in itself, Nonetheless, it is an indispensable means for the realization of higher ethical ends and values. It permits these ends and values to be powerfully reaffirmed. Now, as I say, this is an implication of the first point. It's because the market is ethically neutral, so that it does permit uh, moral men and women to pursue their goals. See? It provides uh, the, the uh, social organization that will permit these goals to be pursued with a high degree of efficiency. Third, however, because the market does cater equally to the fulfillment of unethical as well as ethical goals, it follows that the market may come to be blamed, and as I will maintain, to be blamed incorrectly for the immorality to which it may cater. A market system permits unethical behavior, it permits immoral behavior, and it seems to the uncritical observer as if it is the market which is responsible for uh, unethical immoral behavior. I will maintain that that is an unfair criticism of the market, but it is nonetheless to be, to be observed that that will be the case. That it will be the case that the market will permit unethical behavior, as opposed to other systems which might conceivably interdict unethical behavior. The market will permit it. The market won't be responsible for it, I will maintain. But the market will permit it, and therefore may be incorrectly held to be responsible for it, because it permits it. It follows indeed that if one were to wish to block any particular kind of behavior on ethical grounds, on moral grounds, on decency grounds, it would be necessary indeed to limit the freedom of the market. That, that, that does follow. And that therefore involves uh, the question of uh, one's commitment to libertarianism, or the degree to which one believes liberty to be uh, a, a an ethical goal in its own right. I will fourth argue 
that there are some kinds of immorality which are in fact prevented by a market. I don't think these are, this is awfully important, but, but there are such. I will, for example, show that uh, greed is in fact made harmless by the market. Now this may seem, this may seem uh, paradoxical, but I, I, will, I think I can show that. I will further argue that there are some kinds of immorality which could hardly be conceived outside a market. For example, fraudulent exchange. I, I don't see how a, how a system in which exchange were, uh, were uh, ruled out altogether. I don't see how there could be room in such a system for fraudulent exchange, of course. So certainly, if one permits exchange, when one is, one is uh, opening the door, possibly, to fraudulent exchange. And finally, I, uh, and that's of course been implied before, that a free market is in fact the only system which is fully consistent with the maintenance of individual liberty, which of course has ethical implications all of its own. You see. So th those will be the conclusions that I will, I will be reaching. Uh, and I've simply stated them at the beginning uh, in order to facilitate uh, uh, the, uh, discu the discussion that I'll be coming into right away. Perhaps, yes? Sir. You were using the term rights as, as something that is exchanged on the market. Is that correct? A right may be exchanged. It's not, the, it's not crucial to its definition. Could you explain what you mean by that? Yes, a, 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 a right. I may have a right to... <coughs> Uh, to breathe fresh air, I, I, it may not be altogether obvious that I can I can exchange that with you. you see. Uh, but but a right may be exchangeable, or it may not. A right is simply is simply uh, the ability which I have, recognized by the rest of society, to engage in a certain a certain act of consumption. So I can speak. Um, at the moment, I can use this podium. You see, I can't take it with me when I go home tonight but I have the right to use it right now. So, so I have that right. Uh, this may not be exchangeable. I'm, and I'm not quite sure whether, whether Fee would permit me really to, no, to accept bids for the use of this podium uh, for, the rest of this, for the rest of this hour, and I'll carry on talking over there. I'm not sure that that's, that's uh, uh, implied in my contract with Fee. Uh, but but uh, I do have the right, you see. And, and some rights which we have may be exchangeable. So exchangeability is... is is a possible but not a not a necessary uh, not necessarily implied in the definition of a right. What I would like to do is to consider a whole series of objections to the market, a whole series of different specific objections to the market, all of which it seems to me uh, have uh, their roots in some ethical positions, all of which in fact are criticizing the market from some value-laden initial position, and all of which, it seems to me, rest on uh, one or another particular economic fallacy. And uh, I would like to sort of go through these, these specific objections to, uh, to markets, to market systems, and to analyze these particular fallacies as I see them. The market has often been criticized as promoting materialism. Market societies are seen as sunk in uh, gross material consumption. Very often uh, it is argued that uh, Western capitalist societies are, are decadent or likely to be decadent because of their pursuit of materialism. It's argued that uh, markets, capitalism, is responsible for such evils as racism or sexism.
And it, it is, by the way, implied that if the market system were to be replaced by a properly directed centralized system, well, the central planners would make sure that the consumption patterns of society would be lifted up to some uh, loftier level. Uh, the uh, central planning authorities would make sure uh, that uh, racism and sexism would be uh, eliminated from society. So that it's the, mar it's the market, it's capitalism, you see, that's, to be resp that's held responsible for these things. The market, in fact, debases the tastes of the public, it is argued. It's not merely that the markets are materialistic. It's that capitalism progressively debases, lowers the quality of taste, the quality of, of uh, consumption to which uh, members of society aspire. The market, it is argued, produces unsafe products. Unsafe for mind, unsafe for spirit, and unsafe for body. Unsafe at any speed. <coughs> well, these are some of the objections to to markets, and I think you will agree that these these particular objections, these four objections that I've mentioned, materialism, racism, sexism, debasing the taste of the public, and uh, the, the, uns the unsafe character of many products, I think you will agree that these are objections to capitalism which have their roots in particular values and standards of decent behavior. You don't give a child an unsafe toy. And if the market gives a child an unsafe toy, then the market's immoral. You don't give somebody, you don't tell somebody, uh, here's a car, and the car's unsafe. It's not the nice thing to do. It's immoral. It's unethical. It's not nice to debase somebody's tastes for him, is it? And uh, racist behavior is not nice behavior. And if the market is responsible for this, then the market suffers uh, on, on ethical grounds. Well, these criticisms, these objections, I think illustrate what uh, a Chicago professor, George Stiegler, once called the fallacy of blaming the waiter for obesity. Blaming the, the blaming the waiter for obesity fallacy. And I think that that captures the, the fallacy that underlies these criticisms perfectly. And it illustrates the, the conclusion to which, one of the conclusions to which I will be, on which I will be converging. The waiter brings the food. Without the, without the waiter having brought the food, the obesity problem might not have existed. Is it fair to blame the waiter for the obesity? The answer is, of course, it is not. Because the consumer ordered the food. The waiter simply brings whatever he's asked to bring. You order good food, you get good food. You order food that will promote obesity, that's what, that's what I'll, I will give you. I am simply the the obedient servant, I the waiter, I'm simply the obedient servant which caters to whatever you want to, to whatever it is you want to uh, you want to consume. The market is ex in exactly the same position. The market is neutral. The market ministers to the desires of consumers. If consumers are immoral, the market will cater to their immoral desires. If consumers are moral, the market will provide them with moral goods and services. To blame the market for materialism misunderstands what the market is. The market does not produce materialism. The market responds 
to the desire for material welfare. The market is the efficient social instrument whereby men who seek material satisfaction can get the most of it possible with their resources. The market would stand ready with equal efficiency to minister to a, to a society of saints. If members of society are racist, the market will of course permit racism to be carried out. The market does not does not make it profitable to be racist. In fact, it can be shown that the market makes those who wish to indulge in a taste for racism, it makes them pay for it. And then of course they can choose to buy as much racism, so to speak, as they wish to pay for. Very often well-meaning interventions in the market, it can be shown, make it possible for racists not to have to bear the cost of racism. So it's not the market that promotes racism. The market permits racism, yes. The free market will permit racism and sexism. It's not responsible for it. No more responsible for it than the waiter is responsible for obesity. Does the market produce unsafe products? Of course it does. Why? Is it nice to produce unsafe products? Is it ethical? The truth is that there is not a sharp line between safe and unsafe products. There is a spectrum of degrees of safety. In cars, there may be very unsafe cars, slightly unsafe cars, fairly safe cars, quite safe cars, very safe cars, so to speak. There are a wide degree of different of different levels of safety. With cars, with knives and forks, all kinds, of com all kinds of consumer commodities may be judged as to the degree of safety which they permit. Generally speaking, not always, but generally, the more safety features a commodity has, the more costly it is, the more it costs to produce, generally speaking. So, as in everything else in economics, safety involves a trade-off. How much safety is a consumer prepared to buy? He may be able to get more safety at a higher cost. The entrepreneur who serves consumers well is the one who correctly gauges the degree of safety which consumers are prepared to pay for. No more and no less. To give less is of course inefficient. People are prepared to pay for safer products, they would prefer safer products to unsafe products, and because there are no safer products they are forced to buy unsafe products. But to give more safety than consumers are in fact prepared to pay for is not efficient either because it frustrates the wishes of consumers. Now you may say, but it is unethical to give a consumer an unsafe product even if he wants it. Now that may be so. That may be so. It may be unfair, it may be unethical, it may be wrong to sell a product which you think may harm the consumer, but which he thinks will not harm him. It may be so. but. Recognize, recognize surely that such an ethical judgment rests on, a, on, a, on an explicit paternalistic, an explicitly paternalistic view, which is another way of saying one wishes to treat other people like children. So that one argues that even though they say, I want to buy this and I, I can take care of it, you tell them, oh no, you, you won't be able to take care of it. In your own good, I, for your own good, I'm not going to sell it to you. There are, there are you can go into a store in this country and buy these, uh, these dippers that can heat up water, plug them in, you heat up water. Uh, I believe across the border in Canada you cannot do that. Now it's quite true that these are very dangerous. You plug them in before you put them into the, 
into the uh, cup of water, it's, it's very dangerous. So, uh, well, is it ethical to sell one of these things? After all, the consumer who buys one from you may, be, may not be smart enough to, re to realize uh, that danger. He may get burnt. No doubt some, some given percentage will get burnt. There is an ethical question there. But, but notice that if someone does sell these items or other items that are not 100% safe, and of course there are no such, there is no such thing as a 100% safe product. If one does sell these, one is selling these commodities to consumers who are in fact demanding them and say, I want this. I don't want you to give me a car that will cost me $2,000 more for a, for a small increment in safety. I don't want that because I can use those two thousand dollars to buy something else which I cherish very much more than the additional margin of safety. So ultimately what is involved in a market selling of unsafe products is again the question of the extent to which one wishes to cater to consumer desires. Consumers may not know what's good for them. It may be immoral in some sense for a consumer to buy, for himself, for a consumer to buy an unsafe product. And the market caters to that immorality, if that's what it is. But the market is not responsible for unsafe products. Sure, the market will never, produce, will never tend to produce more safety than the market is, than the consumers are prepared to, to buy. But that's what a market is for. That's what efficiency is all about. Efficiency is the provision by producers to consumers of the closest approximation to what it is they want that can conceivably be created with given resources. But it's what consumers want that governs. It's not the market that produces unsafe products. It's not the market that forces unsafe products on consumers, on, uh, down consumers' throats. It's the, it's the trade-off which consumers themselves must confront between safety and cost which is another way of saying between additional safety and additional satisfaction of other desires. Let us consider some more uh, objections to the market which uh, certainly uh, involve ethical questions. It is argued that the market is an unjust system. Injustice. Capitalism is unjust. Specifically, it is argued that the market permits employers to exploit laborers. Employers get rich off the backs of exploited labor. The laborers work and the employer gets rich. The laborer produces for the employer. <coughs> That's where the buyer exploits the seller. So the buyer of labor uh, being held to exploit the seller. It is further argued that the market is unjust sometimes in the seller exploiting the buyer. For example, it may be argued that uh, a slum lord, landlord in a, in a slum, may get rich renting out apartments to poor tenants. The poor tenants stay poor, the landlord gets rich. Here it is argued the seller of the apartment has uh, exploited the tenant. The market system is unjust. That is, exchange, which we recognized before, of course, as being central to a market economy, exchange introduces the possibility that one side of the exchange may benefit at the expense of the other. Exploitation, injustice. Well, this kind, of, this kind of objection, the objection that the market is unjust, that exchange is unfair to one side or another, this kind of objection, I believe, exemplifies another kind of fallacy. A fallacy which can be summed up as maintaining that one man's gain is necessarily another man's loss. If I gain, someone else must have lost. So that if one finds that an employer gets rich, the question immediately is, well, who lost? 
If a landlord gets rich, the question immediately asked is, who lost? And perhaps the central lesson of economics is that asking that question is simply missing the point. Exchange, voluntary exchange, of course, voluntary exchange Im involves not one man losing while another man's gains. What exchange involves is, on the contrary, both parties gaining. Voluntary exchange benefits both parties in their prospective estimation. Were it not so, were one party in his prospective estimation not to stand to gain by the exchange, then because the exchange is voluntary, of course he wouldn't engage in it. Nobody enters into a voluntary activity where he stands to lose. That is, where he stands to be made worse off than if he wouldn't engage in it. Voluntary exchange is the remarkable social phenomenon when two parties gain by interaction. My gain does not mean your loss, my gain means your gain. Your gain does not mean my loss, your gain means my gain. Now, this, this, this runs into, uh, into the teeth of popular thinking. Because popular thinking, you see, is not based on markets. Popular thinking is not based on exchange. Popular thinking is, is based on the kind of situation where you have a few people sitting around a table and there's just so, there's just, just so much on the table. And the more I consume, the less there's, is left for you. So my gain is your loss. But that's not what exchange is. Exchange is immune to charges of injustice. Exchange is immune to charges of exploitation. Because voluntary exchange necessarily involves bilateral mutual benefit. In the perspective estimation of the participants, I emphasize perspective estimation because an outsider, you see, may disagree. An outsider may believe that one of the participants is making a mistake. That's, that's certainly possible. So it may well be possible that if, if A exchanges with B, that someone standing on the outside C may say A doesn't know what's good for him. He's giving up something valuable and he's getting back something worth, worth nothing. But B, but, but A doesn't agree with that. Right? A, A is, is, is free to choose for himself. Right? C's estimation may not coincide with A's. So that C may consider A to be foolish and B to be trading on A's ignorance and on A's folly. And C may therefore indict the system for permitting B to exploit A as C sees it. That is, that is certainly possible. But in A's estimation, he is not being exploited. In B's estimation, he is not being exploited. No participant of voluntary exchange ever, in his own prospective judgment, I emphasize that, is exploited. I say prospective because, of course, nobody knows what one gets until you've gotten it. This is true. You sign up for a course, you don't know what you're going to get. You buy a book, you don't know what, what you're going to get. You buy a newspaper, you don't know what you're going to get until you've read it. Because if you, knew, if you knew what was in the newspaper, you wouldn't read it. If you experience the experience, you wouldn't buy it. Every experience is prospective. Right? It's always purchased prospectively, which means before you've experienced it. So that the, the, the valuation which is being considered is always one in the estim prospective estimation of A. Now, C may be a very experienced man, and C may already have experienced that which A has not yet experienced. And that man with the gray beard, C, may be talking to A and say, listen to my words of wisdom, don't do that. You see. Well, A has a choice to listen to these words of wisdom or to reject them. But if, if, he, if he rejects them, you see, he is voluntarily, of course, chosen to do so. Provided, a, provided C is given free, free, free advice. Sometimes C doesn't give free advice, he simply stands and criticizes. So, because it's not true that one man's gain is another man's loss, it's not true that an economic system is unjust, that a market system is unjust. I may add, add a few more remarks about injustice later on, but let me pass on to uh, some further ethical criticisms of the market. 
It is argued that a market rests on greed and selfishness, avarice. These are the fuel. These provide the energy which, which keeps the market going. Greed, selfishness. It's argued further that not only does the market depend on greed and selfishness, the market promotes greed and selfishness. Now, to some extent, of course, this, this, this has validity. But, but the degree of validity which, is, which it has is, I think, uh, the validity which it has is quite different from what the critics have in mind. See, it's quite true that a market caters to whatever it is that people want. So that one may say that the pursuit of what one wants is selfish. And the market caters to the pursuit of what one wants. But it is not true, you see, that the pursuit of what one wants necessarily involves the kinds of selfishness that people condemn, usually, on ethical grounds. Because if what I want to do is to cure the sick, and I pursue my goal with single-minded uh, steadfastness, you see, and I decide that the best way that I can I can cure the sick is not to stand on the street corner with a sign saying, I want to cure the sick. But I decide, perhaps, that the best way that I can, uh, by which I can cure the sick is for me to go into the business of selling hot dogs or producing hot dogs. And I build a factory at the lowest possible cost. And I hire workers and I pay them rock-bottom wages. And I sell hot dogs at the highest prices I can get away with. I'm going to make as much money as I can. Okay? Strictly capitalistic behavior. Right? And I do all of that in order to give my profits to a hospital. Then, then sure, every bit of my behavior has been designed to promote my goals, but has it been selfish behavior? One may call that selfish. One may call that selfish in the sense that such behavior is designed to promote what I wish to promote. But surely, if what I wish to promote is, in fact, an altruistic goal, it's uh, somewhat misleading to call it selfish. The truth is that a market caters to whatever it is people wish to, wish to pursue. Altruistic goals, egoistic goals, or whatever. If one defines the pursuit of goals as being necessarily selfish, so be it. One, one important uh, remark uh, to make about greed and, sell and uh, capitalism is uh, one that I made in passing earlier this evening when I commented that a market system prevents greed from being harmful. I promised to elaborate on that, uh, and I'll touch on it now briefly. If one defines a, a market, as we did, as one in which there is a given system of rights and if one postulates that this system of rights is inviolate, so that no one member of society is permitted to violate anybody else's rights, then you've defined greed out of existence. You've defined any possible harmful influence of greed and selfishness. You've defined it away. The very definition of a market system prevents greed from being harmful. Because if I'm greedy, I can't hurt you, because your rights prevent me from taking away anything that's yours. I can want to have it. But the only way in which I can, in fact, get what is yours is by giving you something which you value more than what you have. The only kind of system where greed can be harmful is in a non-market system, where, in fact, there is communal property, where, I, where rights are not individual <coughs> rights. Then the more I take, because I'm greedy, the less there is left for everybody else, certainly. But in a market system where rights are individual and are inviolate, greed can never be harmful. Let us move on to some other criticisms of the market, which uh, involve some ethical questions. The market has often been blamed for poor working conditions. This was particularly the case in early capitalism, but you'll find it today as well. 
long hours, miserable working conditions, perhaps child labor. These have been laid at the door of capitalism. Capitalism is, is responsible for these things. What may not seem to be uh, a very similar criticism, but, but which I believe belongs in the same, in the same class, are criticisms of, of capitalism which relate to advertising. Advertising is often maintained, debases the quality of life, it debases the landscape perhaps, it introduces um, perhaps immoralities of its own, it involves possible fraud. Advertising has a whole host of criticisms all of its own, and, it's, and they're all laid at the door of capitalism. Well, these kinds of criticisms turn out, on analysis, to be objections to markets which are not really objections to markets at all, but which represent a refusal to recognize that resources are limited. Or, to put it somewhat differently, represents a, a petulance at costs. Petulance at costs rests on the denial of scarcity. In a in a poor society, where resources are limited, necessarily consumption will be less than the level which one would like to have. Of course, that's what scarcity means. Now, a level of scarcity, a level of consumption, which is less than considered to be desirable, even minimally desirable, is then blamed on capitalism. But of course, if, if one lives on a desert island where resources are very few and where the only way in which one can keep body and soul together is by working long hours under very severe conditions, well, that's what, that is what the efficient thing is to do. Now, one may not like that. One never likes to recognize scarcity. But if, in fact, scarcity is a fact of life, it's sheer petulance to complain at the limitations and consumption that are, in fact, inevitably imposed by scarcity. In the history of early capitalism, the only way in which prosperity could be approached, the only way in which economic growth could be approached, was by temporarily accepting poor working conditions, miserably poor working conditions. It's not only in early capitalism, in many, in many cases in, in, in individual careers. Everybody knows that you start out at the bottom of the ladder. But this is surely the result of the fact that resources are less than infinite. But of course, that's what economics is all about, as we all know. Like the first thing you learn about economics is that it has to do with scarcity. Well, what does advertising got to do with scarcity? Oh, great deal. Great deal. Because, in fact, advertising is a result of a scarcity which is produced, in fact, by affluence. Now, this may seem paradoxical. But if you have a poor society, there's no problem of what to buy. There's only one thing you can buy. Okay? If you get, as you get more and more and more affluent, there are more and more competing products. Well, it becomes more and more costly to know what it is to buy what's best for you to buy. Therefore, the market necessarily has to introduce advertising as a shortcut way of making it cheaper to know what to buy. It's the kind of scarcity that is in the need for which is created by affluence. Now, these are, are some of, of, of the criticisms of the market. I, I have not completed my list. We are running out of time. But I think that the consideration of this list and the consideration of some of the fallacies which have been exemplified by this list, I think bears out my original contention. A, that it'll turn out 
that these fallacies can be exploded not by the analysis of ethical uh, systems, but by the analysis of economic systems, by the economic analysis of economic systems. And, indeed, that it will be shown, it can be shown, and I think, I think it has been shown, that the market system itself is neutral with respect to the particular goals which people wish to pursue. I should, however, in discussing the relationship between capitalism and morality and decency and so forth, I should mention uh, two, two points, and you can consider these two points either as defenses of capitalism or criticisms of capitalism as you wish. I think they should be made in the interest of, of intellectual honesty. First of all, I believe that capitalism, if it's to be defended ethically, requires the acceptance of what I've called, or what has been called by others, in fact, a finder's keeper's ethic. That is to say, if I find something which nobody else knows about, then I'm entitled to it. Now, this may seem, this may seem an ethic which might be easy to accept, or it may seem an ethic which you're not willing to accept, or perhaps you're willing to accept it under some circumstances and not under others. I, I, I take no position on this. This is something where perhaps ethical expertise is required. But I, would, I do wish to point out that, that if one does not accept this ethic, then one may indeed have severe ethical difficulties with capitalism. Because while capitalism in general provides people a price which they have accepted in fair exchange, consequently is immune from, the, from charges of injustice on exploitation grounds, Capitalism certainly provides scope. In fact, it rests on that. The whole, the, whole, the whole magic of capitalism rests on the fact that if I find an opportunity for pure profit, I'm permitted to go after it. And pure profit, you see, pure profit opportunities are created by my perceiving something that will be in the interest of other people which they themselves have not perceived. Well, that's fine to keep us. I have no, no difficulty with that. I'm comfortable with that. With that. But, but uh, it's entirely conceivable that someone may say, capitalism is fine, but it rests on a finder's keeper's ethic, which I find abhorrent. Okay? And, and, uh, that's, certainly, that's certainly a possible ethical position. A, a, a second point to, to be uh, stated is that while... While we've defended a, uh, the capitalist system from crude charges of injustice on exploitation grounds, it may, of course, be argued that a system of rights, which one might agree was a, was a correct ethical one to start out with, but if a system of rights at the end of some period, right, has generated a new pattern of rights, which I don't like, you see, then one may condemn the system itself. But let me clarify that briefly. We argued earlier that a market system takes a right, has to take a right system as a, as a datum, as something given. That is correct. And supposing we all, we've, we start out a system and we've allocated rights in some way that we all agree is fair. Right? Supposing simple equality, right? Supposing some, we've all said equality is, is, is the original, is the original um, basis for equ equitable distribution of rights. And in a market system, it turns out that after, after a few months, what was originally an equal system of distribution of rights has turned out to be an unequal system because of the, because of the operation of the market. Some people are smarter than others, some people are better entrepreneurs than others, some people are lazier than others, some people, and so forth. Okay? And supposing one argues that if at the end of the period the distribution of rights has, has uh, taken up some pattern, some configuration of which I don't approve, you see, then one may argue that that, 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 that therefore condemns the whole system as being unjust. Not on exploitation grounds, perhaps, but as in, as in, in fact generating a, uh, an, an undesirable system of rights. Now, uh, I myself am not worried about that either, I, I may say. That is to say, 
I would maintain, if one accepted the, just, the justice of the original system of rights and provided the subsequent steps are each of them just, that is to say, not fraudulent, about all you can say about what justice requires, you see, then any subsequent configuration of rights is necessarily ethical too. But, but that's a particular point of view which others may disagree with, and which, of course, which others do disagree with. You see. So these two points do have to be made about the ethical background of, of a market system. Well, I'm going to be uh, accused of injustice if I carry on much longer uh, myself. Um, what I, what I, I think, try to illustrate is that the market is as ethical and as unethical as the individuals who make it up. The efficiency of the market, then, is not purchased by giving up ethics. It's not, there's no trade-off between efficiency, not in general, there's no trade-off between efficiency and ethics. An ethical system, a, a system of ethical human beings, will not become less ethical merely by accepting a market system of organization. On the contrary, the efficiency with which the market will permit them to pursue their goals will permit them to pursue their ethical goals more successfully with the market than without it. Thank you very much.